today I thought it would be fun to do something a little different by taking you along throughout our day and sharing some of the projects we're doing around the homestead. I plan to start some seeds and make some lard soap, so stick around for those tutorials as well. If you're new here, I'm Stacy, mama of seven, homesteader, and the creator behind the blog, The From Scratch Farmhouse. Come along for a busy day in the farmhouse. I try to start out my mornings by getting myself up and ready as early as I can manage, which can be hard when it's been a long night, but it always feels good to have a few moments of peace before a busy day begins. I try to make breakfast ahead of time so that they are prepped and ready to go. This enables the bigger kids to help the little kids easily while I get to work preparing our dinner and lunch. I call this routine of prepping the day's meal in the morning my kitchen power hour, and it has been such a game changer in my routine. Today I'm making chicken tortilla soup, which really just involves dumping a few ingredients in the slow cooker. You do not have to have this massive roaster pan, a regular slow cooker or instant pot is just fine. But this is allowing me to actually double the recipe so that I can bring some to a friend that just had a baby later. It is one of my favorite easy dinners. All you need are three boneless skinless chicken breasts, one quart of chicken broth, one cup of water, 15 ounces of black beans, 16 ounces of salsa, 14 ounces of corn, one large onion diced, one teaspoon cumin, one teaspoon chili powder, one teaspoon garlic salt, and a half teaspoon paprika. Mix well to combine and set on high heat in your slow cooker or 300 degrees Fahrenheit in a roaster pan and let cook for six hours. If you are starting this in the morning, you can just switch it to keep warm after it's done cooking until you are ready to eat. One warning with the roaster pan, it did evaporate more water than a slow cooker, so I would suggest adding some additional broth if you go that route. After dinner is going, I'll clean up that project and move on to making lunch. Today I'm making some sourdough crackers, cheese, tuna salad, and sliced apples. Sourdough crackers are so quick and easy, and you do not even need a super active starter to make them. In fact, I realized after I started making them that I didn't have a cup of starter, so I just added some flour and water and it turned out great. To make sure I was adding the correct amounts, I just used the ratios that I use when feeding my sourdough, which is 3 8 cup of flour and 1 quarter cup of water. For the crackers, you need 1 cup of flour, 1 cup of sourdough, 1 teaspoon brown sugar, quarter teaspoon salt, half teaspoon baking soda, quarter cup olive oil, and salt for topping. You can also add in herbs or whatever else your family likes. Mix well. Then dump onto a clean surface to finish combining and kneading by hand. Then separate the dough into two balls and set aside to rest while you preheat your oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit and clean up your supplies. Next, roll out the dough, cut it into squares, I used a pizza cutter here, and optionally poke some holes in each of your homemade crackers. Top with coarse salt. Then they just need to bake for about 12 minutes or until they start to brown. I'm baking mine on a baking stone here, but really any pan will work. After they are cooled, I will store them in an airtight container until lunch. I also want to point out that I usually have a kid or two helping me in the kitchen in the mornings as well. In fact, on some days I have my older kids making lunch while I'm making dinner and it works out great. A little side note here, you'll see that I'm putting plates on top of my bowls instead of say plastic wrap or foil. I saw another homesteader do this and I thought it was brilliant. No more throwing away the plastic after a one-time use and it works just fine for this short period of time that I need the food to be in the fridge. After I clean up the kitchen, it's time for school. We do school most days from 9 to 12. I usually just spend my time bouncing from child to child as I need help and then if I have time I'll do a learning activity with the little ones. I never force my preschooler to do bookwork, but he actually really enjoys it, so we'll work on it whenever he asks. If you're curious how we handle homeschooling with so many children, I have a video specifically on that that I will link here. And as far as curriculum, I do have a video on that, but I am going to be making an updated curriculum video soon. Around noon, or whenever the kids are done with their independent subjects, we head downstairs for lunch. I'll usually have a child set everything out while I'm helping someone finish up upstairs, Today, since I was filming, I was here to hand everything out. While they eat, it's my time to catch up on work tasks, such as answering comments here on YouTube or responding to emails. Okay, the kids are all outside for the time being. This is a time of day I like to call mom's work hours, and it's just a time when I get the chance to just focus in on projects I have to get done 
or things for the blog. Today I'm multitasking because I'm filming this for you guys and I'm gonna make some lard soap. So I know many of you have told me that you're really nervous to work with lye. I completely understand. I am very careful because I'm very nervous as well, but I just wanna show you a few things. So this is sodium hydroxide, which is also known as lye. And basically if it gets on your skin, it can cause a reaction that will burn your skin. But you don't have to be so fearful because if you do things in the right order and you follow a recipe, there really is nothing to be nervous about. Um, the two things I would say to pay attention to, well, three things. Make sure you don't have any kids or pets right in the area that you're working, um, just in case they would come and knock things over. My kids are outside right now, so this is a good time for me to do this. Also, make sure to have some vinegar on hand. If this gets on your skin, it's not gonna immediately like burn a hole right through your arm. Uh, if you splash some vinegar on it and wash it off with the vinegar, it will neutralize the lye and you'll be fine. But you'll notice I am wearing long sleeves, gloves, and I will be wearing safety goggles because you can never be too careful. Okay, so I'm gonna show you what I have here and then I will just get started. So the lye, obviously, this I believe I purchased just on Amazon. Um, I believe you can find it in hardware stores as well. And then I have my lard already measured out and ready to go. We render our own lard here. You can also find it um, at the grocery store usually. So it's not quite the same thing, but it'll work for this project. So I measured out my lard already. You also need distilled water and the vinegars just to have on hand. It does not go in the recipe. You also should have some, especially the pot that you're going to be putting your lye solution in, should just be for soap making. You don't want to be making soup in this later. So some, a stainless pot, stainless whisk, and then I also have an immersion blender that is only for soap making. So having these specific materials for soap making is very handy. A few other things I have here that I'll show you. I have this mold that I'm gonna be pouring the soap into. This is really handy, but it's not completely necessary. You can just use any sort of box or milk carton cut out. I've seen some people um, line a box or something with a grocery bag. So you can get a little creative here. You could probably use parchment paper. It does not have to be a special soap mold. However, these work really nicely. This one comes with a little lid and then this I won't need until tomorrow, but this is for cutting the bars. I also have just some fun things to play with. I have a soap mold that says lavender on it. And then I also have some dried lavender, so I might play with that a little bit to see how creative I am. The scale is the other really important thing. You need a scale that measures in grams and will be precise enough to get this right because your measurements really matter. So if you have your measurements off, not only will it not set, but it could cause issues where the lye is not going to process correctly and will continue to be something you don't want on your skin. So make sure to get the proportions correctly. So go with the measurements I have. Otherwise, if you want to play around with soap recipes, there are calculators online that will help you figure out how much lye versus how much fats for example, if you're gonna be doing a different fat than lard, you need to be using this calculator so that you get your recipe right. Okay, so this is already figured out for you. Um, I have that recipe right here on my computer to look at. Okay, so I have 1200 grams of lard in here that I've already pre-measured out. I am going to measure out my water now. So when you're measuring things, you need to turn on your scale and hit tear after your bowl is on the scale. So now it's back at zero and then I can measure and it won't take into the account the weight of the bowl so that I can get an accurate measurement. So I need 456 grams of distilled water. Perfect. Okay, so I have my water. I'm gonna go ahead and set that aside. And now I'm going to measure out my lye. So I'm going to clear the scale, put my container. This container is only for soap making. And I'm going to tear out the scale. This has 
has not been opened. Okay, so we need 160 grams of lye. Okay, we are ready to go. So I am going to place my pot on this because it's gonna get really hot. Okay, I'm going to put my safety goggles on before we get started. Now I'm going to take my measured amount of water and pour it into this pot. Make sure to get it all because you don't want to throw off your proportions. And then I'm going to slowly sprinkle my lye into the water. You always want to add lye to water, not the other way around. I've been told a way to remember which direction it goes is snow on a lake. I have my soap only whisk here that I can stir the solution. The goal here is to make sure that the lye dissolves into the water without touching it because it's gonna heat up very quickly. It's also gonna give off some fumes, so I don't want my face right over the top of it. So I'm not gonna talk while I do this. So that looks, I don't want to put my face over it too much, but that looks like it is about stirred in, completely dissolved. It just looks like water at this point. Okay, I'm actually going to leave this in here, tilted on its side. Okay, we're done with the scary part. That wasn't bad, right? Okay, so obviously this it could still hurt you if it was to splash up on you, so we're still going to be really careful. But I'm going to set it aside for now. And the next thing I'm gonna do is heat up this lard. So all I have to do is melt the lard. And the next goal is to get the lard and the lye mixture to the same temperature. So I'm shooting for 115 degrees Fahrenheit for both the mixture and the lard. I've seen other recipes that call for it being 100 degrees or 110 degrees. It really doesn't matter as long as it's right around that point. The most important thing is that they're both the same temperature. That way it will mix together well and then you can pour it into your, your mold. So we're almost there. This is really a very simple process. This is also a good time to make sure your mold is ready to go. But be careful, I have found that lard heats up very quickly and cools down slowly. Only heat it until the point where all of the lard is melted and then remove it from the heat. Now that the lard is melted, I'm going to dump it into my soap only pot. Then I'm going to slowly pour the lye solution into the lard. At first, I will just stir with a stainless whisk, but once it's well combined, I will start switching back and forth between using an immersion blender and the whisk. Just be careful and make sure that the blender is completely submerged before turning it on. Run the blender in short bursts. Don't just keep it going the entire time or you will burn up the motor. This is not a quick process. You might even start to wonder if it will ever thicken up. What we are going for here is what soap makers call trace. This literally means that when you drag something through it, the lines don't disappear. Even after I start seeing this happen, I will continue to blend the mixture a few minutes longer. It should look like pudding consistency, and when I let drips come off of my whisk or blender, the drips will sit on top. This is also known as medium trace. I have achieved medium trace, so I will go ahead and carefully pour the mixture into my molds. I'm playing with a fun shaped mold here that I have previously sprinkled a little dried lavender in the bottom of. The rest will go in my loaf mold. The exact ones I'm using here are no longer available, but I will link below some similar ones. Also, after you pour the mixture into your mold, make sure you take your whisk or spoon and make some up and down motions to remove any air bubbles. I'm just going to have a little fun here with the top, but you can just leave it plain. And in fact, after you remove the soap from the mold, you will be able to clean up the sides. I just thought I'd experiment a little here and try giving it some texture and sprinkling on some dried lavender. I will smooth out the top first, create my design, sprinkle on the lavender where I want it, and then gently press the lavender in so that it doesn't just fall off. The next step will be to let it sit undisturbed for 24 hours. 
I will also wrap them with a few towels to help keep that heat in for a little while. When I come back tomorrow, I will slice it up into bars and then place those bars in a place where they can cure for four to six weeks. And actually, a few months of curing is best for quality bars. While they are curing, they will need airflow. Shelving in my laundry room is where this will happen for me for now. And then once my cellar warms up a little bit, they will go in there to finish the process. Well, my work hours are about over and it's time to get my chores done and let my kids know that it's afternoon chore time. This is when they do animal chores, take out garbage, and things like that. For more about our chore system or other systems that we use to keep things moving in the right direction here, check out the entire video I made on systems and schedules, which I will link here. Okay, the kids are out doing animal chores, so I thought I'd come outside and show you around. But there's really not much to see right now. This is definitely Wisconsin's ugly season. It is the spring thaw, also known as mud season. It's very ugly, very hard to walk around. So I'll give you a quick glimpse of what it looks like, but there's not much going on. We're mostly just trying to get through the chores and then enjoying the warmth as it comes. I can definitely tell that spring is near though because we have one very pregnant cat and it seems like the animals just know when spring is coming. When I first noticed that she was pregnant, I thought, oh no, because it was like negative 30 out, very cold with wind chill that is. And so now that it's warming up, I feel like she knows what's going on. The kids took their last spin on the snowmobile last night. Now we will probably park it since the snow is going to get really sloppy. But then again, the joke might be on me because I've been told snow has fallen every month of the year here in northern Wisconsin. And I have seen significant snowfall in spring here. So who knows what's ahead? I have noticed in the almost five years that we have lived here though, that when summer does decide to show up, it doesn't mess around. So I will be out in the currently snow covered garden before I know it. Definitely one of our goals here this summer is to create better shelters and watering setups for our animals. We cut back to just chickens and pigs for this winter because of that, and even then it has been somewhat of a struggle. Fencing is another thing that needs an upgrade. We quickly figured out that electrified netting and other portable fencing systems don't work well in this climate, so some more stout permanent fencing is needed try to tell myself that these less than ideal conditions are creating both strength and character. They are not laying well. It's probably this mud. They probably don't like it either. What does it like it either? You think the chickens don't like the mud either? <laughs> After chores, it's time to clean up and eat dinner. Dad had to work late tonight, so it's just us. I cannot stress enough how nice it is to have dinner ready to go without rushing around in the evening hours. We like to top our chicken tortilla soup with sour cream and Fritos. I haven't made those from scratch yet, but they are definitely on my list. Sour cream will definitely be happening in the spring or early summer when we get our milk cow. I cannot wait. We did have a milk cow when we first moved here, but the fencing situation was not working out. So we hope to get that fixed and then get a new milk cow soon. Since I didn't get starting seeds done during my work hours, I thought it would be a fun evening activity that the kids could help with. In our climate, it just doesn't pay to start things like tomatoes and peppers too early because our last frost date isn't until June 6th. So today we will just be starting onions. I've learned to be patient and I will start the other things in a few weeks. Onions are very easy. And in fact, I have another video that goes over my seed starting setup and exactly how I plant them. One change this year is that I do not plant in cells, which are the trays with the individual holes. I decided planting onions works much better in flats or half flats like you see here. I have also decided that I haven't seen a significant difference in using seed starting mix versus potting soil. I just try to make sure it has some nutrients so that I'm not having to fertilize right away. Also, you wanna make sure that whatever you use is sterile, which you will know because it will say that it is good for indoor or outdoor use. This is so that you don't end up with bug or insect eggs hatching in your house. Onions are also a good one to have the kids help with because you really can't mess it up. I try to make sure that the seeds are dispersed nicely and not covered up with too much dirt, but other than that, perfection is not necessary here. Also today, instead of using plastic domes to hold the humidity in, we're just going to cover the trays with plastic wrap and some toothpicks to hold up the plastic. I have used both methods and they both work fine. As soon as the seeds germinate, I will be removing the plastic anyway. 
Okay, I just have this mess left to clean up and the kids are off getting ready for bed. Our day is about over. Thank you so much for joining us here in this day in the life and getting projects done. I hope you found this video encouraging or helpful. And if you did, please give me a thumbs up and make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss my upcoming videos. I make content each week on homesteading, homeschooling, food from scratch, and creating a handmade home.